Hi, I'm Tim Belcher. Welcome back to the channel. In my last video, I made some laser lake art. I went through the entire process from graphics to the actual cutting. Consider this video sort of a part two. In that first video, I talked about this concept of digital first, working on the graphics and the value of those graphics for other projects after. So today, I'm going to take these Yeti knockoff mugs. These are actually build brand mugs from Walmart fairly inexpensive, maybe 10 or $11 each. And I'm gonna engrave the paint away. I'm gonna take that map, configure it to be engraved onto these Yeti knockoff mugs. So laser engraving that map on a rotary. This is how I made it. If you watched my last video, this should look familiar to you, at least somewhat. I'm not going to go into anything that was covered in that last video, so sort of consider this a part two. Let me go over some of the updates and changes I've made to this specifically for laser engraving onto this steel with either a paint or a powder coat covering. First, and this is not really the way to manage this correctly, but I've copied all the components in this map to various artboards. One for this 12 by 12 square one for this circular one I'm working on to etch and cut this out of acrylic for one of those uplight LED projects, one for that thin mug at five inches tall, and one for that larger mug where I can only engrave the top at about three and a half inches tall. And this allows me to rearrange the elements like the logos or the info box based on the size and shape that I want to actually engrave. The downside is if I fix something or make a change, I need to fix it in each one or recopy that element and replace it in each artboard. Anyway, since I'm not cutting the lake out, rather just etching it, I added back in the islands. And this is something I didn't really talk about in the last video, but there are several small islands on this lake and it would have been a pain to find and glue them back into a single layer map like I made last time. Again, there's a technique there that I'm using for the coastal region map I'm working on now where I track and label the islands to place them back into a multi-layer map. But for this etch, I brought them back. I've also labeled the bodies of water in white. Realize that anything black here will be etched, which will remove any of the paint and leave the stainless steel visible. Which brings up my next point. I've essentially shaded this map until it is a black and white image. Now there is some nuance to this in terms of using this K40 CO2 laser to remove paint. I could have left this map shaded and chosen various raster shading options. Let's jump into Lightburn and look at some of the previews and I'll show you what I mean. First, let's choose this image which is a complete shaded image and set the raster option back to grayscale. When I preview and zoom into something that is shaded like this state park area, you can see the preview can't do a very good job of rendering the final result. And if you think about that, you're manually controlling the power of the laser within your range to vaporize different amounts of material. And that's fine for wood and you can get your settings dialed in, but for paint, you are really sort of removing it or not. And remember, a CO2 laser of this caliber cannot really mark metal. So I am really removing the paint and there's not really a point in removing just some of the paint. So you have different rastering options or algorithms. And basically, these are different methods to remove little dots to achieve something that looks like grayscale. Think of the way an old dot matrix printer used to work, but just in a negative mode. Let's look at a preview for the dither option and zoom in really, really close. And you can see the state park is still visible, but if you look really close, you can see that choice, even as light as the gray is, removes a lot of paint, maybe too much. And there are others, Stucky, Jarvis, Newsprint, Halftone, and more. And these are very common algorithms that you find in some graphics packages as well. Some are refined and some are less refined. You have to find a balance between your shading choices and the interpretation of that shading by your laser. But for me in this project, that didn't make sense. If it is truly black and white, let's actually make it black and white and control those variances ourselves. So back into Affinity Designer and take a look at the stake park here. 
I've downloaded a diamond plate pattern and used the shapes of the points of interest as a layer mask. The laser will then remove my pattern and leave the majority of the shape untouched. Let me zoom in really close to that pattern for you. Now I've also added a stroke to the outside of the shapes, basically adding an outline to them. And in the end, my shaded shapes are now just black and white. One other touch that is important, take a look at the area label for the state park here. If you look close, you'll see it has a white outline around it. And that little separation of white space will make that text more readable. I did this by copying and pasting the text and then changing the color of that second copy to white. And then I expanded the stroke out. This will be different in whatever software you use, but you can easily Google it. You can see the difference when you hide that white background, and I did this in various places throughout the map that I thought would help. And then it was just a matter of choosing size and layout for the mugs, and that's as simple as measuring out the areas that we're going to engrave. For these thinner mugs, that circumference was right around 10 inches, and for the larger mugs, it was just under 12. And because the maps were not very dense on the edges, I actually let them overlap just slightly so it's hard to recognize a gap. As far as height, I could get about three and a half on the larger because of the shape of the bottom half of the mug and about five inches on the thinner mug. Now that I have my dimensions, I made some final adjustments to those art boards for each of the mugs and exported them just as I did before. Okay, let's do some work on the laser. Now while I lower my bed and get the machine ready, let me show you my rotary setup. All right, this is the original rotary that I got as part of the bundle I got from Orion Motor Tech off Amazon. And I think this is the most basic rotary that you could purchase, a single stepper motor and simply knurled rods that spin. You put a cylindrical object in and as these rods spin, it rotates the object. Easy to calibrate. I got this in, I got it to work fairly well, fairly reliably. I did have some walking depending on how I set my cups up. For these, you have to manually shim them. You have to figure out some way to shim them. Uh, I think a lot of people use their lasers to cut circles that they could actually add on to the object. So it takes a lot of measurement and a lot of setup. I simply used electrical tape to raise this end and I would put a single piece of electrical tape around this end to keep it from walking. Uh, again, I got good results, fairly decent results, but fairly quickly I decided to upgrade the rotary to another one that I purchased from Amazon. And that's this one. And again, I'm not sponsored by anybody on this channel. This is just simply one that I found on Amazon for a couple hundred dollars that I, I thought looked adjustable and fairly easy to use. This has four wheels, again, single stepper motor, but this end can move up or down. It can move out or in to adjust for different size cups. Now, when I set this one up, again, not too hard to get set up. I did find that my objects were walking as well. So let's move this up where it might work for this type of cup. And as I was rotating it, you can see it here. Uh, I would find that the cup would almost constantly move forward. So what I did was I simply took a small piece of acrylic, in this case, a small ruler, taped it against this edge to give me a hard stop. And now I have an actual hard stop for my material. And I actually used that walking motion to make this rotary fairly reliable and accurate. I should say that I've already powered on my machine and hopped into Lightburn to change the machine settings at this point. I simply loaded my presets for the rotary, wrote them to memory, and turned the machine back off. These settings will be specific to your machine, and there are several videos on YouTube that go over setting up your rotary and saving those settings. And with the machine off, I'll disconnect the Y-axis stepper motor and connect the rotary drive there. It's up to you to place the entire rotary attachment so that it is in line with the x-axis. I can then power on the machine and it will home with the settings for the rotary. And this is a lot slower than it usually is as the y-axis is configured to be much much slower than normal in this mode, otherwise your cups and objects will fly off the mount. 
But once it's complete, you can manually move the original Y axis to make sure your laser is in the center of the object you're working with. Since the axis is no longer powered, there's no resistance. I will adjust the bed up and then measure the focal length on the left side of the cup. I'll then move the laser to the right and remeasure, and for that right side, I'll simply adjust the rotary level until both sides are correct. That key there I'm using is custom. My little import came with this little piece of acrylic to set the focal length, and it's about 8 millimeters. I cut and etched some custom depth gauges to test, and it turns out my focal length is more precisely 6.5. These edges on the key also help to feel the nozzle and make setting this easier. All right, let's jump into Lightburn and load that mug graphic. I'll rotate it and throw it somewhere over to the left where I think it's close. And I'll place it as close to the top of the bed as possible so the rotary will not move far to start the engraving. I will then use the frame feature to see where it will engrave on the cup. And I'm paying attention here to both the location of the graphic on the cup, trying to space it evenly between the top and that raised lettering, and also watching and trying to set the starting position so that raised lettering is somewhere near the center of the image. I can then simply adjust my X position in light burn a little left or right each time and that helps me move the graphic to exactly where I want it. And once it's ready, we can simply let it rip. And always, my settings will likely differ from yours. For these mugs, I'm using a speed of 400 millimeters a second with my power set to 35%. And to be honest, I'm not really sure if that's optimal or not, but it seems to work. I'm gonna give the GoPro some hazard pay and throw it inside as well. Total engraving time on this was about 20 minutes. This is the cup fresh off the laser. If you look closely, you can see just a little bit of discoloration around the etched lines. And that's simply some of the residue of the paint. And we can easily remove it during cleaning. The larger mug is basically a rinse and repeat of the same process. Obviously I needed to lower the bed a little to accommodate the larger mug and adjust the rest on the rotary to work with that different sized base and level it. And this was simply a taller, thinner version of that graphic. If you were doing repeats of the same design and mug, changing one out and restarting the program would only take a few seconds and you can easily see how someone could do a large order of these. My cleaning process is two simple steps. All over the forums, people will swear by one brand of cleaner or another, but I take just a little of this goo gone on a paper towel and it does a great job of quickly removing any of that residue. And then finally, I'll just hand wash it in the sink with some soap and water. You can see a huge difference very quickly. Hi. I usually don't come back at the end of my videos. I usually just show the results of my project and sort of peace out. But for this one I had to. I had to make an update. Between the time I shot this video and edited it, I was playing with this large thermos. And this came out to be one of my best results yet. But it didn't start out that way. I was playing with masking material, specifically some low tack mask that I had gotten to see if I could get better results, better detail, finer detail. And this particular thermos had a thicker coating than I was used to. And when I finished, everything silver on this, stainless on this, uh, was just a black and blue gobby mess. It was uh, terrible. And when I tried Goo Gone on it, it did not work. And earlier in the video, I had mentioned that uh, several people on the forum seem to have some sort of religion about their cleaner of choice. Uh, I remember one of those comments where they had said the Dollar Generals in the United States had this product called uh, LA Totally Awesome Cleaner. This stuff. 
and I happen to be about two or three minutes from a Dollar General here at the house. So I ran up there and in the middle of this pandemic, they actually had some of this stuff still on the shelf. I got it and within 10 minutes, it cleaned this thing from what I would have considered an abject failure to literally one of my best uh, results yet. So consider me a convert into that cult of LA totally awesome cleaner. So anyway, I hope you like this content. If you did, give it a like, hit that subscribe button, ask me anything, more than happy to answer what little I know about this topic. This is the second in that league series uh, of digital first art. I'm still working on other projects. I'm working on a new leather wallet, actually a couple of leather wallet designs uh, using this lake image, as well as some larger coastal region art that will feature those layers that are common in some of these maps. Anyway, be safe, have a good one. I'll see you on the next one. Thanks.